guys, welcome back. So in this video, what I'd like to do is showcase a new product that I've introduced. This is a new style of horn. I call it the Nighthawk. I might change the name. Somebody on the on the, one of the Facebook groups said it's a new bow tie horn, which it does look like a bow tie, but uh, let me know in the comments if uh, you have a better name. So this is a unique design in the sense that it's got the hourglass shape and it's a two-way horn. So it features a central high, high frequency horn in the middle, flanked by six mid-range drivers and a mid-range horn top and bottom. And so the idea here is that you get co coherent, co not co-entrant, but coherent sound by virtue of the drivers all being on the same plane. And the driver spacing is actually very close together. So you can see here, this the mid-range driver is a fatal Pro 4 inch, it's the 4FE32, which is a uh, neodymium magnet, uh, relatively affordable, it's $40 US each. And so in the center, we have a one inch compression driver, which is my favorite affordable compression driver, which is the RCF ND350. And so in this video, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the design and then do a full set of acoustical electrical measurements on this horn so that you can see how it performs. So this horn is intended for audiophile two-channel music. It provides high sensitivity, so you're talking around 100 dB sensitivity from 200 hertz up to around 18 kilohertz. And so this also can be used for pro audio type sound reinforcement because of the uh, overall maximum SPL output capability, which is around 130 decibels. Okay, so um, the entire horn is constructed on my CNC and it's made from st uh, glue lamb, multi-laminate, Baltic birch plywood, which is a full hardwood. And it's been fully CNC machined. I designed the horn in SolidWorks, which is a 3D CAD modeling program. And so the horn uses my exponential spiral horn flare geometry that I've developed, which I find uh, performs quite well in terms of sound quality and, and uh, flat frequency response. And so if I turn the horn around, you can see what the back looks like. As you can see here, we have the rear compression chamber. It's the sealed rear chamber. And the rear chamber is made out of, uh, again, multi laminate stacked Baltic birch and then it's been machined out on the inside to form the volume and so the volume has been precisely calculated uh, for the mid-range drivers and then the compression driver just sits in its own separate area separate from the rest of the rest of the drivers. So the stand here is a support leg with a with a base and so I didn't want the the support leg to be kind of an afterthought. I integrated it into the design. Um, the, the assembly is actually a bolted construction, so it actually comes apart. So there's two screws up here, two screws down here, and then that allows what I call these pedals, as in the pedals of a flower. These pedals disassemble for shipping so that it can ship uh, much more compact than, than what you see here. So, um, so I've added the phase plugs in between the drivers. So that's to help extend the high frequency ext uh, bandwidth of the mid-range horn to try to match with the high frequency horn. So the, the mid-range horn is designed to go down to 200 Hertz and using a 350 Hertz crossover. The high frequency horn is a, is a two kilohertz horn and then it's designed for a five kilohertz crossover point. So let's get started on some measurements, shall we? So I've started with the electrical impedance of the mid-range driver, and so I'm gonna show you the mid-range driver performance. The, uh, the resonant frequency of the sealed rear chamber is pegged at 200 Hertz, which is what I calculated for it to be, uh, considering that I'm gonna use a 350 Hertz crossover point. So moving on to the frequency response, so this is an on-axis, frequency response and you can see that the uh, minus 3 dB down point is 180 Hertz. So we're getting really good uh, low mid bass extension on this horn. And then you can see that it provides extension up to around 1.5 kilohertz. And so, and then you have a gentle 
falling response at about a 12 dB per octave. Um, so it's down 12 dB at around 2.6 kilohertz. So looking at the step response, so this is a good indicator of uh, a clean horn that's free of reflections. And so you can see that the step response is very quick to settle and there's nothing uh, really unusual about the step response, nice and clean. Looking at the burst decay, uh, burst decay for the mid horn, it shows a very clean result. No reflections or resonances that are being set up in the throat or off the, the uh, mouth of the horn or anything like that. So off axis. So what I'm gonna do is show you the off axis colored polar maps for both the mid range horn and for the high frequency horn. And so you can see here the off, off axis colored polar map for the mid frequency. We're getting really good pattern control starting at around 600 hertz. And then at around four kilohertz, you're starting to see it narrow. So we're, what we're seeing here is a 90 degree coverage across the horn's bandwidth. And then just showing the off axis in a different way, you can see it here as a, a waterfall type off axis measurement and it just gives you a better picture of what, what it looks like overall. So overall, I would say it's, it's well behaved. Now, these were taken in my living room. So if there are some reflections, they're gonna be introduced into this. So um, it does give you a rough idea of the uh, off axis characteristics. So distortion, um, just a note on the distortion. I don't, don't always show distortion, but what it does show is that uh, there's no issues and that there's nothing that would actually be hindering you from achieving the ultimate sound quality. So what I'm saying here is that the distortion could actually be lower than what I'm showing here, but it's actually just simply showing that there's no issues. So what we're seeing here is that um, the third harmonic distortion is only at 0.2%, and that is around one kilohertz. So we're getting very clean, low distortion sound quality from the, from the mid-range horn. Uh, another way of showing it is with the scale change to dB instead of percent. And you can see here that we're at minus 59 dB from the fundamental at one kilohertz for third harmonic. All right, so let's move on to the high frequency horn measurements. And so this, like I mentioned, it's using the RCF ND350, which is uh, 1.7 inch. Uh, it's a polyester diaphragm. And so you can see here, this is the electrical impedance curve. And so it has its main resonance pegged at just above one kilohertz. And so generally it's a well-behaved driver with a relatively flat impedance curve right out to, uh, to 19 kilohertz where it has just some very subtle uh, breakup modes in the diaphragm. But overall, I, I really am happy with this compression driver. It's a very smooth sounding uh, with, with great tone. So looking at the frequency response on axis for this, you can see here that it's, it's pretty decent frequency response for a, a two kilohertz horn. And you can see here that it's providing great extension right out to 19 kilohertz. So off axis performance, you can see here that we're getting uh, good pattern control starting at around three kilohertz. And the coverage remains wide uh, at 90 degrees, even at 15 kilohertz. So the horn here is definitely achieving the performance target that I was looking for. So another way of showing that would be in the waterfall off axis map and so you can see it there just for reference. Step response, uh, step response is very good on this driver. You can see here, um, nothing to note as unusual. So moving on to the burst decay, you can see the burst decay is also relatively clean, um, not as good as the TAD that I had shown you in a previous video, but for this price category, um, the, the RCF performs uh, very good. So it's distortion measurements, you can see here, 0.12% uh, on the third harmonic at five kilohertz. So again, we're seeing extremely low numbers for distortion. So again, just don't want to show you on the dB scale, same measurements just shown with the dB scale on there. So, um, so let's move on to the crossover. So like I said earlier, the crossover point uh, for this design was set for at five kilohertz. Um, I'm gonna show you the on-axis frequency response with just a standard 5K crossover and it's using a 24 dB LR slope. 
And so you can see it there. Um, relatively flat with the exception of the 10 dB dip at three and a half kilohertz. So what we're seeing here is the mid-range horn is having difficulty fully extending up to the five kilohertz crossover point, which is asking a lot, to be honest, for a horn. Typically a horn will only cover at a max, uh, it'll only cover about three octaves of sound. And so this is more, I think, something that I'm gonna be looking at in the future, maybe changing the mid-range driver to a different driver because if I look back on some of the other horn testing that I've done, for example, the Fostex, the FE126EN, it actually is, it does quite a bit better in the three and a half K region. It's only down by about five dB. And so by selecting, I think, a, a, a mid-range driver that first of all has a lower QTS and has a more aggressive rising response, hopefully the rising response in the driver will sum to somewhat flat. And so we're trying to get maximum bandwidth through that critical mid-range, that vocal range where we want everything to be done by the same driver. And so what I'm trying to achieve here is 200, 300 hertz starting point covered all the way up to five kilohertz with one driver solution. And so the trick has always been, well, how do you actually integrate a high frequency after that? One that provides a coherent sound. And often is the case, the driver spacing is so far apart that when you're listening to music, you can actually uh, locate where the sound is coming from. You can say, oh yeah, the highs are coming from over here and the mid range is over here. And that for me personally, and I know for a lot of people that can be very distracting when you can actually tell where the, the, the drivers are. And so, and so this is Rev00. <laughs> and uh, I will be continuing to develop further revisions to this design and that's one area where I'll be looking at is how to get a flat response rate right out to the 5 kilohertz. So looking at um, the off-axis polar map, we've got some good news here. So we can see that the polar map is actually very well controlled across the entire bandwidth. So the only thing worth noting again is that there seems to be some excess energy at the three and a half kilohertz region, which from what I can tell, I believe it's from the dip that we're seeing in the frequency response. So I'm hoping that once I fix the one issue, the other will go away. So, but overall we're getting, um, you know, 90 degree coverage that's very controlled right out into the 16 kilohertz region. So um, moving on to my subjective lis listening impressions. So what I did is I went through a lot of my albums and listened to through, through various evenings, sitting down and listening critically to this. And so the speakers have an uncanny ability to follow the most subtle modulations in the human voice. So what that does is it translates into um, very effortless perception of the artist's portrayal of emotion. So male and female vocals both had a sense of realism that almost became palpable. And so it's most often in the case when you have that level of mid-range clarity and realism that it's becomes a very defined window of sound that doesn't extend beyond the physical speaker. So some examples of some speakers that I've heard that are like this are some electrostatic speakers, um, you know, some dipole, um, planar type speakers like Accustats and that. But um, what these speakers achieve, because I'm getting very, very wide coverage across the entire bandwidth, is the soundstage actually extended well beyond the speakers and even beyond the early sidewall reflections in the room. And so I was getting that mid-range clarity, but I was also getting the very wide sound stage that, that you often associate with, you know, like a smaller bookshelf speaker or something like that. So. Um, what I'd like to do now is just rank my subjective sound quality impressions on this. So soundstage depth, I would rank it eight out of 10 on that. Soundstage width, eight out of 10. The smoothness, I would rate at eight out of 10. And the coherence between the mid range and treble. And so I would give this a seven out of 10 simply because of that dip at the three and a half K region. I kind of got a sense of the, there being a separation between the mid-range and treble. Um, it wasn't big, it's 
better than a regular speaker, but um, it was something I think that did need to be addressed. So for, for audio file listening. So the coherence between the mid bass and the mid range. So this is where the speakers truly excelled. So I give this a 10 out of 10. So the mid bass and the mid range were, were tight. Like you could, you, it was just made male vocals in particular. Um, I gave male vocal clarity a nine out of 10 because the two are interrelated. And so vocal clarity for female, uh, eight out of 10. Um, I would probably give it a nine out of 10 if I could fill in that dip at three and a half K. Accurate musical instrument timber. Um, this is on par with some of the best that I've heard. The overall realism, you know, with acoustic guitar and, and vocals, it's, it's, it can become startling in a sense that it sounds like it's, it's in the room. So like my daughter, my 12 year old daughter, when I, I just played a song from my phone and the speakers were playing in another room and she's like freaking out because she thought that somebody was playing a guitar in the other room. It was, it was, you know, virtually indistinguishable from the real thing. So, um, so sense of dynamic range. So I give this 10 out of 10. So these speakers are truly enjoyable to listen to as I went through all of my albums, toe tapping, just really entertaining. And so my, my brother has the vintage Altec A7s with the multicellular horns. So this is um, as dynamic and entertaining as those speakers. Would these speakers be considered audiophile? I'd say definitely. They're, the sound is very refined, very smooth. Um, not as smooth as the TAD TD2001 that I had tested recently. Um, but this, this horn solution checks off other boxes in the sense that you're getting that that horn sound all the way down to around 200 hertz. And so it's providing that mid-range vocal clarity that uh, where the TAD needs to be crossed over, you know, at one kilohertz, we're getting right down to 200 hertz. So, um, so I feel like this has been a big success for me. Uh, I'm gonna continue to develop future iterations of this design and then try to deal with the, the dip at three and a half kilohertz. So that concludes this video. Um, Click like, subscribe to my channel, and feel free to ask a question or comment in the video. Thanks and take care.